increasingly, this project is um, often how many of our projects in the coastal zone are going, which is, you know, back in the day, let's say 30 years ago, um, if we were worried about something, uh, maybe some, uh, some vegetation, maybe you and I could get a grant to go, you know, remove the invasive plants or to, to plant some native plants. Um, and it wasn't that people were narrowly focused back then, but a lot of our conceptualization, a lot of our funding was narrowly focused. Increasingly, we're thinking more integratedly, more systems level uh, uh, thinking. And similarly, funding is sort of tracking that way. So in this case, so have a look right here. So this is the San Francisco Bay Area. As we zoom in, we start to see, start to see these kind of things. So these things are salt ponds. Uh, uh, these are some of the so-called South Bay salt ponds. And so these are areas where for over a century, we've essentially, and this goes on all around the world in different embayment type areas, where we, um, so, so firstly to say this is very, okay, so we had that um, article earlier in the semester that said, let me zoom out a little bit. Okay, so here's San Francisco. And then here's sort of the end of San Francisco. This is San Bruno Mountain. That was when we talked about that the, the developer wanted to slice it off and just dump it into the bay and fill it in, right? So the bay is not particularly deep. The bay is, uh, you know, 20, 30 feet in most places, if not a lot shallower in much of it, right? So it's a relatively shallow uh, body of water. And so uh, in places like the San Francisco Bay for, for a long time, native peoples, uh, uh, folks back in the day, et cetera, would take um, an area, maybe make it a little smoother, maybe smooth it out with some boards or logs or something, and then let the seawater come in and then block off the seawater, make a little dam or a little block of something. And then that sun in the summertime beats down, the water molecules vibrate off, as you guys know, one of the, the great things about our, our water planet is we have the water is that universal solvent, right, as we talked about. And so it, the water goes away and leaves behind the salts. And then you have salt. Historically, that was, especially when we didn't have refrigeration, that was fantastically important. That's how we preserved meat and things like that for extended periods of time. It's also, it also tastes good, right? So we also cook with it. But, but first and foremost, it was really, really powerful as a preservative. And indeed, some cultures around the world used salt as a currency. Um, it was so deemed so valuable. And so then once, once this uh, water evaporates and dries, then you can just go out and scoop it up. In modern eras, we use um, like big tractors and do this on an industrial scale. And what you're seeing here in this particular satellite image, this particular pond area looks orange. That's because these hypersaline areas um, encourage uh, archaeobacteria, cyanobacteria, the, these other these critters that can really take these extreme high temperatures and very salty conditions, mm -hmm. these extremophiles. And so that, that's, that's how, how we can see this. Now, in recent years, essentially a lot of these salt ponds have been um, converted to um, a migratory waterfowl habitat. And so now we manage them, not the water levels, not to make more salt, but to make um, you know, a great uh, a feeding area for birds. Okay, but what that's telling us is that's telling us if, if people around the edge of this bay are flooding it with water and then blocking it off, and they've been doing it for a long time, it must be relatively easy, right? We must be able to do that with technology from you know, the 1800s. So that tells us that the, that the elevation is pretty shallow. So maybe we throw, you know, maybe Victor throws uh, his backpack there or maybe four or five backpacks and makes it you know, a couple feet of sediment would cut off the water flow. So that means it's a very, very flat place. So that's cool if you wanna walk out or if you wanna launch your kayak or you wanna go fishing or wherever it's easy to get out. But in the era of sea level rise, that's a problem, right? If everything is super flat, that means things are quite likely to inundate. So we've not talked about managed retreat yet in this course. We will. But so there's different approaches we can have to dealing with this. But some things are just too hard. Some things are just, it, nah, we can't let that move. So a classic example, I, I, I'll share a video with you guys. This summer, I was in Normandy on the French coast. And, um, and there, one of the last sites of the battle, uh, of the D-Day invasion is preserved on this bluff. And um, 
the, the craters are still there. They're deeper than this room. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And, and, and there's value in us remembering, you know, what happens when you have an authoritarian ruler who's crazy and wants to slaughter half the planet, right? Those, those places are important to interpret that to for future generations. So if that just washes away, we lose some of that visceralness. We lose some of the ability to communicate um, that, that part of our collective history, right? And so in that case, in Normandy, the sea is, a, this is on a bluff, a, a, a sort of an elevated area above the beach, um, is getting eroded because of sea, um, sea level rise is leading to greater erosion, leading to more calving, and the peninsula is starting to become at risk. So that's a place we can't just move. We can't just move the craters. We can't just move the old fortifications. If we want to preserve that, we're going to have to armor it. Similarly, there's some places around here that if or there's some infrastructure that might be so valuable, we can't just easily move it. Can't move it 100 feet inland or something of that nature. And so that's what this project's about. So this is where it's going on. So it's in, it's in uh, East Palo Alto. Um, so this is Palo Alto, this is East Palo Alto. And, um, and, this, and so Palo Alto, oops, sorry, all these things are popping up. Anyways, Palo Alto's over here. This is East Palo Alto. Um, uh, historically marginalized. So, so originally it was just part, of, just part of the place, but then when we started developing and damming, um, the, put a, a thing called the Searsville Dam up here when, when uh, Leland Stanford, so Stanford, this is Stanford University. So when he created the farm, as he called it, one of the things he wanted was a stable water supply. So one of the things he did was dam um, this, this creek, that, this urban creek that goes from here and then goes down uh, over to the water, uh, out to the bay. And in so doing, that was great. We got water and everything, but it also uh, meant people said, oh, it doesn't flood as much. So now we can move into the floodplains. Then we saw all this development into the coastal floodplain, um, which you know, seems great at first maybe, but now that that dam is at risk of failing or is full of sediment and we're, an earthquake might knock it down, now all these people are vulnerable. So invariably, the people that are in the most, or not invariably, but oftentimes, people that are most vulnerable are the marginal folks. So historically, this has been an African-American community, low income. Um, in recent decades, it's become much more Latino, Latina, um, and more mixed. Um, but the point is, it's, a, it's a nowhere near as wealthy, even though it has the word Palo Alto in, in its name, it's nowhere near as wealthy as its neighbor, the uber wealthy, you know, master of the universe, you know, people that found Google and things like that uh, kind of place. However, the city of Palo Alto does maintains a sewage treatment plant right, right next to East Palo Alto. And so they discharge their, their sewage into the uh, bay, as, as, have, as do many um, municipalities around the San Francisco Bay. And the sewage treatment plant is very low. So here's, here's a little snapshot of our project. Hey everybody, let's talk about an example of coastal management that is using science and trying to test a new path forward. So this is an example of an experimental um, approach to management. In this case, I'm sitting here in about a uh, half meter of water, just off from that structure over there, which is um, the uh, city of Palo Alto's sewage treatment plant. So I'm in East Palo Alto in the Baylands Preserve. I'm out here in the, in the marsh. And so what we're looking at right here is we're at very high tide. We're about a plus seven foot right now. And so this is a main tidal channel. So out to here is the San Francisco Bay. So all out uh, as we go forward is, um, is wetland transitioning into open bay. Behind me is all the, the terrestrial area of Silicon Valley, etc. So um, the question here is, uh, so you can see right now, I'm at, I'm at seven, I'm gonna put the phone almost into the water. So seven feet of elevation is getting fairly close, right? So we have another about, oh, I'd say about five feet or so there of, of protection. And then there's another little wall and it's a little bit higher. But, you know, we're talking, we have, you know, at this elevation on just a regular old fall day, we have, uh, you know, a little bit of freeboard, a little bit of area to accept higher water levels, but not a whole lot. And as we have more and more climate changes, we have more and more sea level rise, that water is going to get even closer. So the idea here is can, some infrastructure we can move in the case of 
sea level rise and that kind of stuff. Other things we can't. And this sewage treatment plant would be really, really hard to move. So the idea is can we protect this and can we protect it more responsibly? So we're in the, getting ready to build a um, green infrastructure. So not concrete and stone, but a living, so a berm, a, a so-called horizontal levee. So a, a raised area of soil planted with natives to give greater protection. In addition, where I'm standing, uh, right over here, we have a lot of discharge pipes. So normally the, the treated sewage water comes out, goes into the surface channel, and then that joins the main channel, and that joins out into the San Francisco Bay. Instead, after this project, in addition to raising the, the elevation of the protective um, buffer between the water and the plant, we're also going to be undergrounding the discharge pipe. So we're gonna be making a leach field out here. So now the, the, the treated water is gonna go through soil and plants before it gets out here. So we're out here, um, uh, monitoring for, with a whole bunch of partners here, monitoring to look at the microplastics to see if this is also going to help reduce the amount of microplastics that are going to the surface water. But also we hope to see improvements in terms of like nutrients, reduced nitrogen, reduced phosphorus, etc. So an example of a management activity that's hopefully going to add greater physical protection, but also greater protection to the ecosystem. And at the same time, we're gonna be improving the trails so better recreational opportunities for the public. So an example of a, and now this is only a small section, we're not doing like miles and miles. This is an experimental test. If this works, then we can begin to try this approach in other areas of the Bay and elsewhere. So coastal management here in the south part of San Francisco Bay, the horizontal levee project of the city of Palo Alto with all kinds of great stuff just about to start. Okay, um, so that was a little bit about uh, what we're doing up there. Again, it's the idea is to uh, protect the infrastructure from sea level rise, but at the same time, maybe we can also improve water quality while we're doing that. Maybe we can make nicer, a nicer walking path for the public uh, that wants to recreate around the perimeter. And so if we can do that, if we can ha have multiple benefits, then um, it's way easier to get funding for it, but more importantly, it's way easier to get buy-in, public buy-in, government buy-in, general, um, you know, uh, uh, support for the project. Um, and so, for example, one of the things that was a bit challenging with our wildlife crossing over the 101 freeway, which is finally happening, is it'll be done next year, um, no human trails, no, no, no person hiking trails to go from the north side of the 101 to the south side of the 101. Um, and that was a decision because we wanted to just encourage wildlife. But that, what that meant was that we didn't have access to the hiker community or the biker community or the horse riding community that maybe would have also lent their support. Turns out with the sexiness of mountain lions and stuff and the, and the, the ooh and ah of mountain lions, we didn't need that to, to get it funded. But, but um, when, generally speaking, when we can have these multiple benefits layered on top of each other, the management tends to be easier and much more supportive and oftentimes tends to be more successful. So cool, that's the East Palo Alto Horizontal Levee Project.